The United States is facing a couple major battles. We are heading towards uh, military escalation with Iran and the Red Sea Middle East area. We're also dealing with a, a, a war on our southern border, the, the Texas border um, and, and how Biden is allowing an invasion at the Texas border. To help me discuss that is Colonel Daniel Davis. Colonel Davis, thank you so much for joining me today. You bet. Thanks for having me back, Stephen. So uh, last week, you and I were scheduled to have an interview and it ended up being canceled. You mentioned that there was high tension between Iran and the U.S. military. You were consulting with other military people on the on the escalation and the targeted attack situation. You were also getting back to back requests for interviews. You had one come in from the United Kingdom while you and I were speaking. Uh, 10 hours later, the U.S. military hits 85 targets in Syria and Iraq. Where do you see the situation with Iran going? Because from everything I'm seeing, General Lloyd Austin more and more is using rhetoric that sounds like he's ramping up for war with Iran. Well, I, I if, and he's definitely not the only one that's using that rhetoric. I mean, it's, it's really across the board from a lot of these what I call war firsters who just almost seem to have, Stephen, a lust for war, not just generally, but specifically with Iran. A lot of these guys have been uh, going on forever, and they're using a lot of the things that are going on in the ground right now, misinterpreting what's going on and 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 reinterpreting the require or the op options for what we should do. And they're advocating to the administration. Specifically, you have Jack Keane is just almost hourly on all kinds of you know networks going on and telling everybody. Of course, these are not these uh, targets that, that uh, Biden has launched in retaliation for the killing of the Americans. Of course, they haven't deterred anyone. Of course, the the sh uh, shots down on the Red Sea haven't deterred the Houthis because you're not going after the head. You got to go after the 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 head of the snake in in Iran. That's where it's at. David Petraeus has said you got to go into Iran. Uh, Hodges, General Ben Hodges, you got to go into Iran. Probably several others too. Definitely many people on the Hill are saying the same thing. Lindsey Graham, of course, is the biggest cheerleader up there. And what they are trying to tell the American people is that all of these attacks that are happening in the Red Sea against our troops in Syria and in Iraq, all of this is because Iran is on the march. And if we don't go into Iran, then it's going to be bad news for the United States. That is inaccurate. That is not true. And if the Biden administration listens to that advice, we're almost certainly going to be sucked into a major war with Iran uh, that will be far, far worse than, than any of these people seem to think. Uh, Keene, in particular, uh, is really kind of uh, uh, deceivous and deceitful in how he's portraying this. He was actually asked on Fox News yesterday, uh, look, if we go into Iran and, and we actually strike in Iran, as you're suggesting, um, won't that result in a war? And he says, no, 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 no. He goes, nobody wants a war. Iran doesn't want a war. The United States doesn't want a war. We're not talking about doing like a shock and all like we did in Baghdad in 2003. No, we're just talking about targeted strikes, limited strikes, he used that word, against the IRGC troops in Iran, against their leadership, political and military. Presumably, he didn't specify which leaders he was talking about, just to send a signal that will make them back down, says the general, which is... It, I mean, it, it is so bizarre. Imagine America. Let's say that Russia said, you know what? We're tired of you guys supporting our enemy, Ukraine. We're going to kill some of your troops in, in uh, and some of your leaders as a message to you in Poland or, or in Romania or some of these other places in Europe. We have them as a message because you're helping our enemy. Now, of course, people's heads would explode and we would be at war almost overnight because if you attack a sovereign country, if you attack their military, on their territory, it is by definition an act of war, and it is it is just insanity to suggest that we could uh, execute acts of war against Iran and that they're going to back down. Because look, we had decades of, ex of examples to the contrary that this doesn't make anybody back down. Stephen, I I I have remember when I was first in Iraq. I'm sorry, in Afghanistan in 2005, my first combat deployment there. And we had around 10,000 troops, I think, at the time. And the 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 violence was just starting to rise up among the the uh, the uh, uh, Taliban at that time to, you know, alarming levels of concerning, not even alarming yet. 
I was still able to drive around the country in just a regular pickup truck, no body armor, didn't have to worry about having a pistol or a rifle with me, just my normal sidearm, and felt perfectly safe. There was no problem at all. When I went back five years later, it was a night and day difference because we had every year had ramped up more troops because the violence ramped up. So we said, we'll just put more combat power. We'll attack more. So we'll show those Taliban that it's a bad move and they need to reconcile and not do this because there'll be a price to pay. How many times did we hear that? And then we spun up to this big surge of 140,000 NATO troops, which is when I went back. So I saw the difference between those two. And we all know how that story ended, don't we, with a, an abject, humiliating withdrawal in August of 2021, because we never cowed them. They never got the message, and they kept getting stronger the more violence we used. And we've been in Iraq now for 21 years on and off for the most part. That's still going on. We, we're, we're in Syria now. We're just about to hit the 10-year mark, if you can believe that, from the time that Obama first sent the first troops back in there. That's obviously not solved any problems. Why in God's name do we think that attacking Iran uh, is going to have the opposite effect of all these other decades of experience we have? It's irrational, it's illogical, and it's going to get us sucked into a war if Biden listens. Yeah, wow. Uh, yeah, these uh, these people that are so quick to go to war, it just, uh, it, it really makes me nervous. You know, I don't want five years from now to be sending my teenage son into a war that you know, we're, we're going to lose or spend trillions of dollars on. Um, I, I had read, I want to get your opinion on this, that the, the Biden White House, the president, many people within the Pentagon, they are just drooling at the opportunity to go to war with Iran. However, their consultants are telling Biden, you cannot go to war until after the election because you risk the price of oil going up. And we almost lost the midterms because gas prices were so out of control. And uh, we, we don't have the abortion issue this time. We don't have uh, some of these other issues. People are voting with their wallet and their fear about global war and the invasion on the southern border. So do you, do you think there's any truth to the Biden administration saying, OK, we've got to be a little bit more calculated until the election because if gas prices go up, we are definitely getting voted out of office. Uh, I mean, I, there's there's no politician on the planet that doesn't uh, base his, his decisions, his votes or whatever on how it's going to impact his electorate. So I, I'm certain that Biden is doing that. What I'm not certain of is that that there's uh, an appetite within the administration, you know, to go to war with Iran. But we'll just wait until afterwards because it, it's a definite losing proposition uh, and, and I think Biden would love to not even have to deal with it. I think he would prefer just to get it off his plate. Problem is that there are others who don't want it off the plate. There's others who have this view, Stephen, that the, Iran has been an albatross around our neck for long enough. I mean, all the way back to the 1979 revolution, they've just been a, you know, a, a boil on our tooth for, for so long, and I'm ready to get this done. Let's take this opportunity now to just deal with it once and for all. Like, all we have to do is just fight this war, and then it'll all be over. And uh, I, I, it's, it's again, it's irrational, and it's, it's counterintuitive to the facts of what we've done. Did getting rid of uh, Saddam Hussein solve that problem? It just exploded into a new one. Did getting rid of Muammar Gaddafi solve a problem? Their country is still split in half to this day with two competing governments. I mean, everywhere you want to talk about that we've tried this, it's just turned into complete disaster. And so there's very little prospect that this would have the – because – succeed because, look, here's what has to be understood. Iran, when you look at the, the balance of power between Iran and the United States, it's off the charts. That is so much stronger on our side than it is their side. If the, you know, if you're talking about the air forces, the naval forces, air defense, uh, you know, uh, mechanized warfare, all of those, you know, tanks and all that, man, we're just ten times better than them in all those categories. But that's not to suggest that they don't have some serious capacity on their side, in especially in their ballistic missile force. By many accounts, they have the most sophisticated indigenous uh, ballistic missile and precision guided missile uh, force in the region. And, and it has struck targets that were defended by American Patriot Systems, precise pinpoint accuracy in the past. So that probably should serve as a warning that, OK, these guys are a little bit better than we think. If we go in there and thinking it's going to be a cakewalk, which some of these like Keen do think think that we can just 
throw around enough lead and they're going to back down. But the, so they can hurt us in that. And as you pointed out correctly, the probably the biggest tool they've got is the ability to shut down the Strait of Hormuz because that can jack up the price of oil for the globe. And it can affect everybody's economy, not just the United States. But if they get into a potential existential war that they think the balance of power would be against them, of course, they're going to go to the two things that give them the most leverage against the United States, and that's their missiles and their ability to shut down the Strait of Hormuz, which they don't want to do unless they absolutely have to, because they don't want to get into a war. That's true. That's accurate. They don't want to, but they want to be able to push back as far as they can so that they have a you know a regional player and that they don't get bullied by us. That's that's their objective here. There's one other thing, Stephen, I think that we dare not uh, bypass without considering because it is of paramount importance to the United States. If we do this, if we do what Keene says and you know, Lindsey Graham and some of these others, uh, there was reporting out I saw, I, I, I can't remember which one it was yesterday, that said the latest intelligence says that uh, Iran could build a bomb, uh, get enough fissile material with what they have right now within a week. It used to be, it was two weeks, just a few months back, but now this uh, a new group is saying it's it's about one week and that they could produce a crude bomb within two or three months after that. So you're, you're talking about the potential, if we give Iran the motivation because they think they're facing an existential fight against a global superpower, they're going to run to the bomb. Now, they apparently, according to even CIA, they have not done that to date, even though they've been ramping up production in direct relationship to us getting out of the JCPOA and getting rid of all the constraints that used to be on them. That's a separate issue here. But if you go to war with them, the chances that they rush to the bomb are through the roof. And now then... You have the prospect of saying, holy crap, they're going there. Now, the only way you can stop that is a massive bombardment and probably a ground incursion because there's a good chance that they've got these deep underground bunkers that even our best bunker busters may not be able to get into. And you wouldn't know unless you went in on the ground. You would have to go in with a ground invasion. And there is no chance that we could mount a ground invasion of Iran that has any chance of success, anything short of like three quarters or to a full year from now. And that would just be devastating to our economy. We cannot do it. There's a huge risk if we take these actions. Yeah. Is it also fair to say that in the past, um, fighting with Iran didn't come with the new partnership with Russia and the new partnership with China? Would, would, they, would they back their partner Iran against the United States or would they stay out or do we not know at this point? You know, I, I think in the past, I think it's pretty clear that, that Russia and China would not have helped uh, 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 Iran in such a situation. But right now, uh, I, I don't know as much about uh, China. I think that they would they would be a little bit more coy or at least a little more uh, covert about how they might help. But I think Russia would be potentially uh, going in pretty strong because they would probably say, OK, America, West, you guys have been – absolutely just swamping our enemy who's been attacking us with all this stuff. And you keep telling me you're not at war with us. You're just helping your allies. Well, okay, we're not at war with you. We're just helping our ally, Iran. So you can't go to war with us because otherwise we'll have to go to war with you on this one here. And of course, we don't want to risk you know, nuclear Armageddon. So I think that there's a good chance that Russia would do this when before they wouldn't. But now then they have motivation to, and we have cut their their reason for restraint that used to be the case because we are helping their enemy kill their troops on a daily basis. So now then their motivation would be much higher. So I think that's a much bigger risk than, and, and I'm glad you brought that up because I don't think that many people even think about that factor. Yeah. Um, switching gears, coming back to the United States, uh, the, the hottest topic in the news right now, other than, you know, something about Donald Trump is this Texas border situation the, the Biden administration uh, says the border's not secure now. They, they've been saying it is for three years. Now, all of a sudden, that their Democrat voters have woken up and realized we're being invaded. They're like, oh, no, uh, we, we've got to do something about it, right? So there's been three to 4,000 people coming across the border on a daily basis in Eagle Pass, Texas. Uh, Governor Greg Abbott has said no more. Uh, we've got 25 states, 26 states, actually, backing him saying, we will defend you in court. Uh, we, we've got National Guard being sent from Florida, North Dakota, 
uh, many, many different states. They've put up the barbed wire um, and that it went from 4,000 people a day to three people a day. And yet the Biden administration continues to hammer saying, let the illegals in, let them in, let them in. Where, where do you see this going? Is this going to just continue to be a, a battle in the courts and a, and a battle on TV? Or is this going to actually erupt into the National Guard versus the federal U.S. military? What, what do you see happening on the Texas border? Well, let's, let's certainly hope it doesn't come to that. I mean, that is that is probably my biggest concern. I don't think we're at that point yet. I, I think that there's a lot of anger, but I think there's also some understanding of limitations on both sides, whether at the National Guard level or at the federal level. Uh, but there is no question that this is is a, an explosive issue uh, that's that's that really is messed up again by like you mentioned on a different topic a second ago by the presidential election because uh, there's no doubt that. The, many of the Republicans uh, are seeing how important this issue is to the voters. And look, we guess we got to be honest, a lot of them want to keep it that way all the way up to Election Day so that they can keep the, all of their side ginned up and, and angry. So they're not really in a mood to have a negotiation with the Democrats that has some kind of a bipartisan plan that they passed. Because after having done nothing, as you said, by Biden for like three years and not even admitting there's an issue, now he sees the same polls that that's the number one issue. I can't remember the last time, if and maybe it's never happened, where the border was actually above economy on what's important to the to the American people. And I, I was that's that's a real eye opener for me just to see that how important it is to America. Now you know, you know Texas, Arizona, the California, you can see why it's important to them. But but wow, you're talking across the country, it's the the biggest deal. So that unfortunately also means that political parties have incentive to try to manipulate the situation to their advantage. Uh, so you have the Democrats who now they go, oh, crap, we got to make some kind of a deal so we'll look good in November. But they also go, but we also don't want to be seen as giving in to the Republicans and giving away because then that'll make their base unhappy. So they're asking for things and uh, they want to put stuff in this bill that the they know the other side won't like so that they think maybe we can get this in and of course the exact same thing is happening on the republican side where they don't want to have biden get a win because he's desperate to get a win and i think he's uh kind of not being a good poker player by making it pretty obvious that he's desperate to get an, a deal now to get this off the table because he knows it's not a winning position for him a, a winning issue at the at the november election and unfortunately, the Republicans recognize that, so they're not in any hurry to come and make a deal. And you see, uh, you know, Mike Johnson uh, is not uh, inclined to do that. Uh, and there's he seems to be holding pretty firm on that. And you have Trump openly saying, "Hey, we get everything that we're asking for, or there's no deal." Uh, and you know, there's no negotiation ever is going to work like that. So I don't know how this gets solved politically, but militarily. Uh, or national security wise, maybe is a better way to put it. I, I, I do see that there's some a real issue with that. I, I mean, look, you can't have that many people crossing in your border openly with nobody vetting anybody and no not knowing what's going on or be able to know even where they come from, what their background is, that it's not going to be a risk to our country. Uh, I, I mean, there's lots of reporting and, and I think that uh, it's it's plausible. That like lots of Chinese have come in who may not just be looking for a better way of life, but maybe looking to embed themselves here in the event that there is a future war between China and U.S. over Taiwan. Uh, I don't. Who knows what other countries may? Maybe Iranian people have been sending some people over here. So if there's actually a war, they may have sleeper agents within our country. I, I don't know. I don't have any evidence to that fact, but I do know when you don't have control of your border and you do have enemies abroad then the risk is real that there could be people coming through. And we just wouldn't know uh, until they're already here. And we might not know until they actually do something. But what is absolutely seems to me should be a no, negoti no negotiated deal is that our border is, is controlled. So we only let in people that we want to. If you want to have you know debates over who should be let in or what should be the, you know, the criteria for allowing people how many Okay, y'all battle that out legislatively. Uh, I'm, I'm not that concerned about it. But whatever the law is, I want to see the border controlled so that we know who's in our country and we get to make the call, not just whoever rolls across the Rio Grande. Yeah, 
I, I read a report yesterday that Denver police in the last 90 days have arrested 50 members of Al Qaeda that are that are in, embedded in Denver City, Colorado. Uh, I, I, I can't I can't say that they have bad intentions, just that after running who they are, they're they're linked to Al Qaeda. And I, and I would guess that there's more cities that have these pockets. Uh, again, I'm not saying for good or evil, just that they're finding them. Um, and that was one of the big problems uh, with 9-11 is most of the people that carried out 9-11 were already in the country. Um, so so that is a little bit scary. You know, you mentioned uh, you, you've never seen the, the border issue be higher than the economy issue. And I would agree with that. I, I think one thing that's fueling rage is uh, New York City, for example, They've got uh, illegal immigrants uh, put up in posh hotels that are four to seven hundred dollars a night. They've kicked out veterans. Uh, the homeless population isn't getting this kind of treatment in New York. Uh, and then Mayor Adams just announces uh, yesterday a thousand dollars a month to these illegal immigrants. For some, for some people, that's more than they're getting on Social Security after having worked for the United States and their fellow citizens their entire life. And now illegals are getting uh, posh hotels, three meals a day, cell phone, um, medical treatment, a lawyer to try to keep them in the country, and now $1,000 a month. Uh, I, I can see why American taxpayers are furious. They're going, wait a minute, what about the children? What about the veterans? What about our senior citizens? They're literally being treated like second-class citizens. In our own country where they actually are citizens. Yeah, and it's, it's look, I, I mean, I, I love this country. I love the history of our country. You know, we have some ugly scenes in the back, and that that's something we have to acknowledge and, and deal with and make good, uh, you know, on areas where we didn't do good in the past. But we are an, a nation of immigrants. We, we were created that way, you know, from all over the place. And the, the where they come from has shifted in, over time. And the amounts have come and shifted, uh, you know, to, to none, to, to these huge numbers of back and forth and whatever. But I'm also of the staunch belief that if you want to come to America because you want to have a better life, good on you. That let's If whatever our laws are, to whatever extent the percentages are, then they'd come on. But wh whoever comes in at whatever level, then I think that they should all have a fair deal that they come with their own resources and their own abilities. And th that's how all the immigrants that came in before, that's how we became such a, a great country in the 17 and 1800s and people coming across. No one handed them anything. No one gave them anything. In fact, the fact that they didn't is part of what made this country great because they they overcame all these obstacles. They did whatever it took to succeed. They had that drive, that passion. I mean, that's kind of indu in, in, indicative of what makes America as a country great, because we do have these passions, these drives, these willing to work hard, all this stuff. When you just hand money to somebody without making them having to work for it, number one, it obviously gives incentive to some of these people who a thousand dollars a month could be, you know, making them rich compared to where they're coming from. And so, of course, they're going to want to come and get that. But as you say, we have people that are on in the country now who could probably use some help, or, or uh, at the very least. You can't say I'm not going to help these American categories and I am going to help these people who aren't American people. I think that you should be responsible for yourself. You should learn our language because this is our country. You, you want to speak your language, go to your country. That's fine. You can do whatever you want to do. But if you're going to get along in this country, you have to as, as, assimilate into the culture that we have, into our laws, into the way we first and you get the same fair deal every other American gets. Nobody hands stuff to you. Nobody hands stuff to me. You either get it because you work hard and you produce something for the country, or if you don't, then you don't make any money. And and I think that everyone deserves the same deal. And we should not penalize anybody from who comes in as an immigrant. I do not believe that for a second. I have great admiration and respect for many people who have immigrated here who are wonderful human beings, and I have the highest of respect for them. And they worked hard for what they got, and they followed the rules, many of the ones that I know. And so I, I value that. And we welcome that kind of stuff. It's the other categories uh, that are a bit problematic. And I know people's hearts may be in the right place that we want to help these people out. I don't think this is the way to do it. Yeah. Wow. 
Well, thank you so much for coming on and, and uh, talking with us about Iran, what's going on, these paid generals on the mainstream media encouraging war, uh, you giving, you know, like more insight into the good, the bad, and the ugly of some of the decisions that could be made by our, our leaders in D.C., uh, also this Texas border situation. Uh, thank you so much uh, for coming on. If people want to follow you, Colonel Davis, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, we, we have a we have a, a daily show uh, on YouTube, sometimes multiple episodes called the Daniel Davis Deep Dive, where we take a look at things that are happening in the world. Uh, and you, we go in deeper and give you more context. And we also are telling you the truth about what some of these people are saying. We hold them accountable uh, when they try to say things that actually aren't true. And all you got to do is just, you know, go to YouTube and type in Daniel Davis Deep Dive. We'll pop right up. Great. And I'll make sure to put a link down below so they can find it easily. Thank you so much, Colonel Davis, for your service to our country and for coming on today.